On this Sunday night, for the first time, one of the Danforth victims is speaking publicly about the night everything changed when she came face to face with a gunman. It was a bit surreal because when I made eye contact with him, I mean, he didn't look like he was a shooter. Daniel Kane may never walk again, but she is resilient and determined. Her story of recovery and remarkable empathy for the man who shot her. Also tonight, the debate after that shocking upset at the U.S. Open. Was Serena Williams the victim of sexism? And hitting back at Donald Trump, why Stormy Daniels' lawyer thinks he's the guy who could take down the president in 2020. A Canadian exclusive with Michael Avenatti. This is The National. Seven weeks ago tonight was a warm summer evening here in Toronto. On the Danforth, people were out enjoying dinner, taking a stroll, when shots rang out. The gunman, by all accounts, walking calmly, methodically, firing into restaurants and groups of people. His motive is still not clear, but we know the panic he caused, the two people he murdered and the 13 others he wounded. Daniel Kane is one of them. She was struck by a bullet after running out of the restaurant with her boyfriend to help another victim. In her first public comments, she talks about that moment she saw the gunman, a chance encounter that has forever altered her life. No one expects to, like, go out on a Sunday night and then, like, have their life completely turned upside down. Like, no one expects that. Um, like, it was... It was just an ordinary day. Really. And like, we hadn't planned to go there like like a week ahead of time. It was just, we literally planned like hours before the event, like before the incident to go to that restaurant for my friend's birthday. You don't think when you hear sounds like that, that there are anything other than fireworks. Like I thought it was just fireworks. Basically, as soon as we step out, I made eye contact with who I didn't realize until moments later was a shooter because he immediately started shooting at us. And um, that's when I, once I saw the shots, like I turned and like I felt, like I felt the shot, like, um, and immediately my, my legs like buckled under me. I don't want to dwell on that night, um, yeah. but if I can, I just want to ask you a couple other questions about that night. For sure. One is, conf like, seeing the gunman face to face. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a bit surreal, because when I made eye contact with him, I mean, he didn't look like he was a shooter. He was standing calmly, he was looking in our direction, and immediately, like, um, you know, like his hands came up and he was shooting at us. Kane spent days in intensive care at St. Michael's Hospital, heavily sedated. The bullet hit her spine, then her stomach, before exiting her body. Somebody has to come in that room and tell you the extent of your injuries, including the possibility you might not walk again. Do you remember that moment? Um, yeah, that was a hard day. That was, um, because obviously, you know, prior to to the incident, like I had all these ideas about like what I was gonna do with my life and like what the next like five, 10 years were going to be. It is going to be different. A lot of people understandably have expressed their anger at the shooter, but you may be surprised to hear how Kane feels about him. I've, um, I guess I, oh, like, I, I feel comfortable disclosing this. Like, I mean, I've had a history of depression, so I can relate to the feeling like that you don't like you don't feel like you can connect to other people or like you feel like um, like the world doesn't understand you or like you um, like feeling like a lot of pain and not knowing where to go or having feeling like you have no one to talk to. I don't take it personally that that the shooter did this. Like I I, I feel sorry for them. I wish that perhaps that they had the help that they needed. So you didn't go through a time when you were angry at him? Um, I've had moments, absolutely, where I did, um, but I think that's normal, and um, I do, I think that's normal. 
After the Danforth shooting and so much other gun crime in Toronto this year, the mayor, John Tory, has called for a ban on handguns, which Kane supports. I don't think the general public needs to have weapons. I mean, like in the hands of law enforcement, I think that's different. But in the hands of, like, you know, lay people, I, I, don't, I don't think we're more safe. So I'd like to see them off the streets. I asked Kane about what seems like one of her most remarkable traits, how calm and accepting she is about what's happened to her. It's not just a mask I'm wearing or anything. Like, I mean, a lot of people have said to me, you know, they can't believe how well I'm taking everything. But to me, it's like, I just, I don't, I've already suffered enough. Like, I've suffered a lot, you know? Like, why make things worse by, like, deciding to be unhappy and deciding to be, uh, to feel like, you know, like I was cheated out of a life that, like, this other kind of life, like an able-bodied person's life. Like, I mean, I'm not. I haven't been cheated, like, we, like, nothing has been guaranteed to us, so. There is a lot of work ahead. Two more months in this rehab facility, eventually continuing her studies as a nurse. Not exactly the life she was living two months ago, but as close, she vows, as she can make it. Kane and her boyfriend are dealing with a lot of change, of course, and they're grateful for donations they've received from family and friends across the country, but also from complete strangers. Support, she says, which allows her to focus on her recovery. Here's a look at some of the other stories we're working on tonight on The National. Serena Williams says it was a case of sexism. A closer look at the controversial call that may have cost her the U.S. Open. And the top boss at CBS is stepping down after new allegations of sexual misconduct, but that doesn't mean a hefty severance payout will follow. First, though, the investigation continues inside the White House. Senior members of Donald Trump's inner circle keep insisting they didn't write the anonymous op-ed in the New York Times. As Paul Hunter tells us, one actually said today the crisis has brought them closer together. Somewhere inside that place right now, Donald Trump is still wondering, who can he no longer trust? Who did it? Who wrote it? That stunner of an op-ed in the New York Times by an anonymous Trump insider branding him amoral and dangerously unfit for the job. Do you think you know who Anonymous is? I, I don't. I don't know. But I, I do know that they should resign and leave this administration. Trump's vice president is among a long list of confidants now repeatedly denying they did it. Today, Pence went a step further. Should all top officials take a lie detector test, and would you agree to take one? I would agree to take it in a heartbeat. The latest act of resistance is the op-ed published in the failing New York Times. Trump has suggested the op-ed may be treasonous. But today, Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway emphasized that inside the White House, its effect has been bonding. I'll tell you what happened this week. The team tightened up even more because of all this. Folks who don't even work together because they deal in different portfolios, different issues. We are tighter this week because we are so joined in our outrage. But there's a clear pattern in the Trump White House. From early news reports, Trump's first Secretary of State had called him a moron to best-selling books labeling the president as ill-informed and possibly deranged. This week brings a new one by journalist Bob Woodward, he of Watergate fame. That's him on the right in the early 70s. Excerpts describe a White House in utter chaos. Today, Woodward gave a sobering assessment of his new book. This one was in the belly of the beast. And what did you conclude about the beast? That people better wake up to what's going on. The book, with its Trump insiders calling him a reckless, lying idiot, is out Tuesday. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. More fallout for Serena Williams today. After losing yesterday's U.S. Open final, now she's been fined $17,000 for her conduct during that match. It was an upset, Williams losing to a 20-year-old from Japan and calling the umpires penalties against her sexist. So is she right? As Natalie Collada reports, it depends who you ask. There's a lot of men out here that have said a lot of things because they're a man. That doesn't happen. 
Serena Williams is calling foul. In yesterday's U.S. Open final, Williams was hit with three costly penalties, all from umpire Carlos Ramos. The first was for getting a signal from her coach, not allowed. The second, for breaking her racket. And the third, for this. Does that say you're a thief? Because you stole a point from me. For that outburst, she got a game penalty. For me to say thief and for him to take a game, it made me feel like it was a sexist remark. I mean, like, how uh, he's never took a game from a man because they said thief. <laughs> For me, it blows my mind. Williams is getting some high profile support. Tennis great Billie Jean King tweeted When a woman is emotional, she is hysterical and she's penalized for it. When a man does the same, he's outspoken and there are no repercussions. And tennis star Andy Roddick wrote this. I've regrettably said worse, and I've never gotten a game penalty. However, Ramos is known as a stickler of an umpire. At last year's French Open, he gave Novak Djokovic a penalty for a time violation, then another for yelling at him. The way the scale works of how they, how they, how they sort of adjudicate, you know, the first time you get a warning, the next time you get a point penalty, and the next time you get a game, she got to that third stage, and, and then all heck sort of broke loose. Williams lost the match to the 20-year-old Naomi Osaka, her victory marred by the controversy and boos from the crowd. Um, congratulations, Naomi. No more booing. A classy gesture after an ugly match, but Williams says she's going to keep speaking out. I'm here fighting for women's rights and for women's equality and for all kinds of stuff. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. William's $17,000 fine breaks down like this. $4,000 for the coaching violation, $3,000 for what's called racket abuse, and $10,000 for verbal abuse. A small fraction of what she made for coming second yesterday, $1.85 million. Now to a developing story, CBS has reached an exit deal with embattled CEO Les Moonves. On the same day, he was hit with even more sexual misconduct allegations. Another six women have come forward in a New Yorker article published today. And that brings his total number of accusers to 12. It also brings him to the end of his long run at the network. Renee Filipponi watches developing stories for us Sunday here on The National. And Renee, what more can you tell us about all of this tonight? Well, until today, Ian Moonves was one of the most powerful executives in the U.S. media at the helm of CBS for 20 years. And now he is the first CEO of a Fortune 500 company forced out of his job following these allegations of sexual misconduct. Now, in today's new article by Ronan Farrow, another six women make claims about Moonves going back to the 1980s. Some allege he exposed himself without their consent. Others forced them to perform oral sex. Others who spoke to Farrow say if they turned Moonves down, he actively worked to damage their careers. Now, Moonves has maintained his innocence and says he has had consensual relationships with some of the women, but in a statement late tonight announcing his departure, CBS says it will donate $20 million to one or more organizations that support the Me Too movement and equality for women in the workplace. The donation, which will be made immediately, has been deducted from any severance benefits that may be due to Moonves. All right, Renee, 20 million, a lot of money, but there were reports earlier this week that Moonves could walk away with, with $100 million in severance. Yeah, well, that was the talk before these latest allegations surfaced. Now it appears that any severance will depend on the outcome of an ongoing investigation into those allegations. So theoretically, at least, he could walk away with nothing. And Ian, we should also note that Moonves has been locked in a power battle for control of the company with one of its main shareholders, one that he has now clearly lost. All right, Renee, thank you. You're welcome. And now let's take a look at some of the other stories we're watching tonight on The National. Former NFL star Colin Kaepernick is saluting two Miami Dolphins for kneeling during the National Anthem today. Kaepernick praised them on Twitter, saying, My brothers continue to show their unwavering strength by fighting for the oppressed. Wide receivers Kenny Stills and Albert Wilson were the only players in the league to take a knee on this first Sunday of the new NFL season. Just get prepared. Prepare for the worst, but, but hope for the best. 
Officials are warning people to be ready for when Hurricane Florence hits later this week. They say while it may be moving slowly, it's only getting stronger as, it's ma as it makes its way to the southern United States. Generators, water, plywood, popular items at stores in Georgia. And in South Carolina, cities are offering free sandbags. Florence could be as strong as a Category 4 by the time it makes landfall on Thursday. Some travelers are already feeling the consequences of Florence. A Norwegian Dawn cruise ship bound for Bermuda was rerouted to the Maritimes because of the storm. So not exactly the white sandy beaches and warm weather that people may have been expecting, but passengers told us they are doing their best to stay positive about the detour. They brought Bermuda to Halifax. We were hoping for really nice weather, but instead we have the same weather as, as we do at home. I want to be somewhere warm, not somewhere cold. And it is what it is, and my husband's helping me to, to be better with it, as you can see. <laughs> we're from Maine, so we normally wouldn't pay to go north. But that's okay. We're making the most of it. I think most people accepted the fact that this is where they had to be. Oh, we've already signed up for the, the uh, double-decker bus tour. We're looking forward to getting to the Citadel. We want to see the gravesite for the Titanic's uh, victims. We're on vacation. We're not doing dishes or laundry or going to work. So we're just going to go with it. <laughs> the next stop for the cruise line is tomorrow in Sydney, Nova Scotia, where it's expected to be a little warmer than Halifax, a high of 19 degrees. Ahead tonight on The National, the search for Nicole from last night. How a night out at a bar, a wrong number, and a mass email at the University of Calgary brought together a group of women in the name of love. First, though, we'll have a Go Public investigation, one of the last ties she has to her late husband. Why an Ottawa widow was told she'd need to hire a lawyer just to keep his old car. And a little later, an in-depth interview with Michael Avenatti. Rosie sits down with Stormy Daniels' lawyer to talk Trump and why he's considering a run for the White House. That is the test, frankly, as to whether this is about my ego or whether this is about solving a dumpster fire of a presidency that threatens not only the United States but the rest of the world, perhaps. But first, a look at special coverage you'll see here starting tomorrow night. Adrian is in Colombia tonight, a country that is grappling with a crisis next door. This is bad, and the numbers are devastating. So many millions walking out of a crumbling Venezuela that the UN warns what's happening right here is on the verge of surpassing the exodus out of Syria. Those who can't get out through official borders just find another way. Desperation intersecting with ingenuity. See, this is what it's come to. The more the, the Colombian authorities crack down on the smuggling routes and the more the Venezuelans uh, try to stop people from taking out anything they can to try to earn a bit of money, the more uh, these unofficial and pretty dangerous routes just open up. The world they all walk into is chaos. A Colombia under serious strain. There's no system of shelters, only scattered pockets of organized generosity. And those who've made it this far now have to rely on their wits. Some can't wait for help and just keep walking. Where to? Often they have no idea. What they've left isn't war, but there's no mistaking that they are running for their lives. With the UN meeting tomorrow to discuss what the world needs to do to help these people and the countries taking them in, we're with those on the move. A series of stories starting tomorrow as we bring you The National from Colombia. An Ottawa widow is going public after she was left with a car that she couldn't drive, sell, or even give away. Legal fees would have cost more than the car was worth, so she turned to Rosa Marcatelli and the Go Public team for help. The car isn't worth much, less than a grand if she sold it. But for widow Margaret MacArthur, it's one of the last ties she has to John, her husband of 56 years. I don't know what I'd do with it, this car, honestly. Just, it'd be like taking another car of him away. On paper, her husband owned the car. Margaret was the one who drove it. The couple didn't have a lot. They rented their home and had a few investments. They did have this car. John didn't have a will. Where we come from, we don't have wills. Like if I die, he gets it. If 
He dies, I get it. Both Service Ontario and the Ministry of Transportation told Margaret without a will, she'd have to hire a lawyer to get the document she needed to transfer ownership. We should start at $1,500. Got a 14-year-old car. Why don't they just give me the damn car? What difference does it make? She even tried to give it away. So I can't even donate it. Can't sell it. Can't scrap it. Where'd I put it? For years, a lot of provinces and territories have looked at making the process of settling small estates like the MacArthur's easier and less expensive, but very few have done it. Those that have use a simpler set of rules for estates worth between five and $35,000, depending on the jurisdiction. And what that means is that it, things are not equal across the country. This senior's advocate says having a will is still the best option available. But even in situations with one, she sees grieving spouses overwhelmed by the inheritance system on an almost regular basis. We want to make sure that people are able to quite effectively and without too much red tape go through the process at a time where they're grieving. So it's even more difficult to manage. For Margaret, the car is even more important now that she's a widow. She says it's her lifeline to the outside world. I'm trying to move forward, and I do good. Like my worst time is for about 3 o'clock on, I'm sitting here, nobody told you. It's hard. After GoPublic contacted Ontario's Ministry of Transportation, it offered to help Margaret MacArthur in changing the car's ownership. Five months after her husband's death, she now officially owns the car. And Rosa joins us from Calgary. It seems there's a danger here, Rosa, in assuming that when your partner dies, he simply will get what they own. What else should people know? You know, the best advice is have that will and an estate plan. It will make things easier for you. If you can't afford a lawyer to do that, well, look into those free clinics for wills that are sometimes held by law schools. Also, do not take shortcuts, like trying to avoid the cost of probate, and that's when a will is validated by the court and involves legal fees. We're seeing that sometimes people put assets in joint names, Ian, you know, putting their kids maybe or their siblings on property titles, for example, so that they're not part of the will. Well, apparently that is a bad idea. It could lead to problems if the original owner's rights aren't respected. So these complex systems, how are they going to affect Canadians going forward? They're going to be a bigger problem, you know, with the population aging. We all know that more than 100,000 Canadians are widowed every year. That number is also growing. So more people, more problems typically, which makes, you know, this push for these changes even more important and even more timely. Thanks, Rosa. If you have a story for Rosa and the Go Public team, you can send them an email, gopublic at cbc.ca. Next on The National, the Sunday interview with Michael Avenatti. He's ready to take on Donald Trump in court and possibly at the polls. I think that he would not, does not, want to face someone like me in the general election. Mm -hmm. You said that the a run for presidency wouldn't be about your ego. But it has to be a little bit about your ego. If all of that is believable, then why did Mr. Cohen draft an agreement with a signature line for Donald Trump? What I fear for this Democratic Party that I love so much is that we have a tendency to bring nail clippers to a gunfight. Cover-up should always matter to the American people. Are you trying to win a case or take down a president? He didn't know about the agreement. And he didn't, he Considering didn't the tone of Michael Avenatti's recent public question. appearances, the answer is, is probably is both, at least yeah. while the lawyer for Stormy Daniels gauges the political winds. Avenatti's public profile has risen quickly from little-known L.A. lawyer and part-time race car driver to outspoken presidential critic and possible Democratic candidate. Brash and cocky, Avenatti says the key to beating Trump in 2020 is to beat him at his own game. Rosemary's conversation with Michael Avenatti in just a moment, but first, a little background. Michael Avenatti rose to fame as the lawyer for Stormy Daniels, real name Stephanie Clifford. She's the adult film star at the center of a presidential controversy. Did Donald Trump and his lawyer pay her hush money to stay silent on an alleged affair? This is a cover-up. Avenatti defended her before. every chance he got. I think it's pretty clear that my client is very, very credible. It's pretty clear they've been lied to by Mr. Cohen, and it's pretty clear that Donald Trump is covering this up. This is what democracy looks like. 
suddenly in a polarized America, he's become known as a kind of anti-Trump, a role he seems to wear easily, talking a big game about how the Democrats need a fighter to beat the president and how he's willing to do it Trump style. We must leave it all on the field every day and fight for it. Using Twitter as a political tool, he's even got his own hashtag, Basta, Italian for enough. It is time to make America independent again. Now there's talk of a potential 2020 presidential run, an unconventional opponent for an unconventional incumbent. I met up with Michael Avenatti in Los Angeles to talk about just how far he'll go in taking on Trump. At what point it, does this become less about the lawsuit and more about ending a presidency or trying to bring down a president? Well, my number one focus is resolving this lawsuit for the benefit of my client. But that, 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 that's not the only focus. I mean, I wouldn't be here. You know, I, I don't think I followed you on Twitter six months ago. Now you've got 700,000 followers. You are part of a national conversation in a way that you weren't before. So it's not, at what point did it no longer become the only thing you were thinking about? And suddenly you realized you were, you were maybe doing something more than just being a lawyer. I do believe that part of my job is to make sure that the facts and the evidence are laid bare for the American public and the rest of the world. And ultimately, the American public will decide one way or the other as to the consequences, if any, that result from the cover-up and potential criminal conduct associated with this $130,000 payment. Sure, but you're, you're now doing things that are, that are not about that, that are more about uh, pushing back on policy decisions that he's made, whether it be migrant children or other things. You're traveling the country, you're meeting with Democrats. So this obviously went to another level at some point when you realized, hey, I can maybe turn this into something else. Why did you decide to start even thinking about that? Yeah, it really wasn't about me turning it into something else because um, I have a good life. Uh, and my <laughs> life would be much easier if I did not enter the political realm, mm -hmm. um, frankly. And I haven't decided what I'm going to do. And people kind of look at me skeptically when I say that, but that's the honest to God truth. As I sit here right now, I don't know whether I'm going to run or whether I'm not going to run. But you're sussing things out. I, I am. I'm absolutely doing my homework, I'm traveling around the country, I'm trying to raise money for Democrats in connection with the midterms, and at the same time, I'm gauging reaction for a potential run, talking to voters, learning about issues, uh, and I'm being very thorough in my approach. And the reason that I am even considering it is because I am very concerned that the Democrats may nominate somebody that cannot beat this guy in 2020, and the United States and I would also venture to say the rest of the world, including our fine neighbor to the north, cannot afford six more years of this uh, president. I think the consequences will be significant, and I think it will be disastrous. And I frankly believe that the future of the republic hinges on the outcome of the 2020 election. So when you're meeting with people like David Axelrod and other serious people who know how to do this, are they taking you seriously? Very. In fact, I have been, uh, I've been surprised at the amount of positive feedback and encouragement that I have received from senior individuals within the Democratic Party and people across this country, not just have, here. You have almost no political experience. Not, not just here in California, but in Florida and Iowa and New York and New Hampshire and two trips to Ohio and elsewhere. And, Look, it, this is a unique situation. You're not going to beat Donald Trump by nominating uh, an experienced, highly knowledgeable, typical politician that can't hold a stage with him and that cannot uh, compete with him within the media realm that we find ourselves in. You're not going to do that. He's beat 16, he's beat 16 to 17 of those individuals already. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's exactly what is going to happen unless the Democrats nominate the appropriate candidate in 2020. And by the way, I don't believe I'm the only individual that can do that. 
I think there's a few others that can do it. Mm. And we'll see whether they decide to run or not. You said uh, in one of these speeches that you've been giving that when they go low, we hit harder. We must be the party that marshals the power of law and government to strike back at those that strike our cheek and to bring those to justice. When they go low, I say, we hit harder. Why is that the right answer for public discourse in this country right now? Because I'm not sure you guys can go much lower. Well, I, I don't or know. Or harder. <laughs> well, the, the Democrats certainly can go harder. I mean, the Democrats have, have been pacifists for t far too long. They've been on the right side of issue after issue. They've been completely outmaneuvered and outplayed. Um, and outbeaten, frankly, by the Republicans for a very long time. Right, but I'm not sure that going harder and a candidate who's going to embrace social media in the same way as Donald Trump, because in some ways you know how to move the media the same way that he does. Um, how does that make things better for this country if you just all end up playing on the same level? You see what I'm saying? I, I just wonder how that improves politics, improves people's lives, improves democracy. This is about winning. And if you don't win in 2020, you're never going to have a chance to implement policies that affect people's lives. You're never going to have a chance to unify this country yeah. on race or otherwise. You're just not. So, uh, and anybody that claims otherwise, in my view, is just wrong. So this isn't about how one is going to govern. Mm -hmm. This is about how one is going to get the opportunity to govern. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is inept at a lot of things. He's also brilliant at a number of things. One of the things that he's brilliant about is his use of social media, his use of Twitter. Um, he's an expert campaigner. Uh, he knows how to motivate his base. He knows how to deliver uh, branding and messaging. Uh, and too many people have underestimated this guy. And I'm very concerned that others may also look to underestimate him in 2020, and he's not to be underestimated. The only person that has a shot of beating this guy is somebody with a big personality that knows how to hit back. The, the question I would have for you about your, the disadvantage would be Donald Trump arrived on the scene and he was a known commodity to Americans, right? I mean, he had sort of been in their living rooms. He was associated with money. You are not as well known. People are starting to get to know you, but you, you don't have the same kind of brand that he did when he got into it. Would that be something that you would reflect on? Do you, do you think that you could still take him on given the fact that he has this reputation? L love him or hate him? A absolutely. I mean, do you think Donald Trump wants to face me on a debate stage? I don't think so. I think the dichotomy between me and Donald Trump on a debate stage would be shocking, mm. frankly. Um, there's no doubt in my view that I have the presence to do that. There's no doubt in my view that I certainly have the ability to um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him or beyond from an intelligence and insight uh, standpoint. Uh, frankly, uh, and uh, I think that he would not, does not, want to face someone like me in the general election. Mm -hmm. You said that the a run for presidency wouldn't be about your ego, but it has to be a little bit about your ego. Well, you have to have an, <laughs> you have to have you have, an ego. You sound pretty confident. Oh, no, you <laughs> look. You have to have an ego to run for president sure. of the United States, of course. <laughs> and frankly, I mean, I, look. Here's the test as as it relates to whether this is about my ego. If Donald Trump does not run, and if Mike Pence does not run, I will not seek the office of the presidency. And I'll probably never seek the office of the presidency. Mm -hmm. So that is the test, mm -hmm. frankly, as to whether this is about my ego or whether this is about solving a dumpster fire of a presidency that threatens not only the United States, but the rest of the world, perhaps. So when do you make a decision, then? How, how does this unfold? You're going to keep talking to people? I'm, I'm going to keep talking to people. I, I, Honestly, do See not how the have, midterms go? Correct. I honestly do not have a timeline to this. I'm going to continue to travel around the country. And Are you uh, building a team? I, I'm consulting with people. I'm in the process of contemplating bringing people on to help me in the process. Have you talked to former presidents? Uh, again, I'm not going to get into who I've talked to or who I haven't talked to about this. But look, I didn't build my life around trying to take a shot at this. Mm. I didn't. I would have done a lot of things differently. There's a bunch of things I did do that I would not have done, and there's a bunch of things that I didn't do that I should have done <laughs> in the last 20 years, and that's the honest to God truth. Uh, you know, I'm 47 years of age. I didn't expect to be put in this position, but this is a very serious problem facing the United States and others. Somebody's going to have to solve it. I don't know if I'm that guy yet. What's with Basta? 
What's with Basta. that? Yeah, well, everyone, I, almost all your tweets, they just end, Basta. So, so, <laughs> so Basta is a word that uh, I first came to know from my grandmother, who was uh, on my father's side, who was Italian, and yeah. she used to say to me, Basta, growing up, as in enough. And so when I first got involved in this case, I thought it was rather apropos <laughs> under the circumstances. And so I started using hashtag Basta, and it's, uh, it's caught on. So the anti-Trump moniker that people are trying to give you, and maybe that you're embracing, I'm not sure. It's unclear to me here. You're, you're OK with that? That I'm the anti-Trump? Yeah. Well, I think under the circumstances, I, I can think of a few things that would be more complimentary. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. It's Thank a pleasure. you. Appreciate it. Up next on The National, you'll meet a young man in Montreal fighting to be seen and heard, the founder of Canada's first all-trans record label. I'm a transgender, put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up. I want to be recognized as a human, and I want people like me to be recognized as humans too. First of all, we want to tell you about a story you'll see here tomorrow night on The National. You'll hear from two survivors of the Toronto van attack. Ioanna Romiliotis spoke to them about the horror of that day back in April, the challenges they've faced since then, and how their lives will never be the same. Here's a preview. It was the first warm day of spring. A retired librarian and avid reader, Smith was on her way to the public library near her condo when the van struck her and hurtled on. It had already left a trail of broken bodies and intersecting lives. <laughs> Heading to the same library, University of Toronto students Sol Ra and her best friend Sohi. It was so nice out, they had decided to walk the three blocks from the apartment they shared. There was blood everywhere on my body and I felt like severe pain around my face area. And then I was looking around to figure out, and then I saw Sohi lying on the ground beside me. Her clothes and her face, everything seemed so fine, so, but she was just unconscious, so I thought she didn't, like, it's, it's like, I thought it's just taking a bit of more time for her to wake up, but I didn't know, like, something happened to her. On our series Seen and Heard, we take an intimate look at young people grappling with extraordinary circumstances. Lucas Charlie Rose is a transgender hip-hop artist living in Montreal. He knows the pressures and dangers that can come with being a trans person of color, and he tries to make things better for his community. For more than a year, Rose has been taking testosterone injections as part of his transition. And that's where tonight's story begins. I just didn't know queer people existed, you know. So for me, it's like I had all these thoughts in my head. Like I was like, oh, like I have a crush on this girl. Like, oh, I feel like I'm a guy or whatever. And I didn't know that I was, I thought I was sick. And like all the moments in my life that I didn't really understand, like went back in front of my eyes and I was like, oh shit. No, actually, yeah, I'm trans, like. on tea. Today, I'm two months on tea. Today, I'm three months on tea. Today, I'm four months on tea. And today, I'm one year on tea. Hormones make me feel good. When I don't have hormones, I'm not myself. If I didn't have them, like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. I work, yeah, no days off. Yeah, no days off. 
Yeah, if I can't be around people who make me feel validated and actually see me for who I am, then I don't exist. You know, and I think it's a natural thing for human beings to want to be surrounded by people who accept them for who they are and who actually, yeah, respect their identities and see them as human beings. Being a black trans person in this world can be really, really lonely, right? Because people don't see you, right? People don't see you. When they see you, they see you as... They just don't see you as who you are. They see you as something else, right? People would make fun of me because, like, I didn't dress like the other girls. Like, oh, but you're, like, such a boy or whatever. And, like, people, yeah, people bullied me all the time. Montreal, I have... I have friends, I have support, I have fans, and it's not just, it's not even just in Montreal that I have that, but it's thanks to Montreal that I have that. In Montreal, that's where I learned how to be myself. That's where people saw me for the first time. They don't know who I am, yet they're talking about me, trying to bury me on the ground, but I won't let them do it. Cause I'm too lousy, I'm too proud. I started a non-profit record label called Transgenders. For me, it was it's just a project so that trans people can see themselves. This is what trans looks like. And other people can see us. And it's also good music, and we can do whatever other people can do, you know? And if not better, because we've been so underrated, and so we have to work harder than other people. I know how to work without a lot of resources, and I feel like that's one of the skills that I can share with my community. You want it, you got it, can get it, but baby, it's yours. Scars. I just really want trans people's narratives to be a part of the industry. Actually, it can be queer and you can be happy, and it doesn't have to be this terrible thing that everybody's like bullying you about and telling you that you're such a terrible person. I'm a transgender. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. I want to be recognized as a human, and I want people like me to be recognized as humans too. I'm a transgender. To have people see me and just. Yeah, not look at me like I'm a freak or I'm dangerous or I'm all these things. I was like, no, I want people to see me for me. Like, I'm actually, I'm just somebody who's trying to live life and survive and see my people do it too. Our series Seen and Heard continues next Sunday with the story of an Inuit pop icon. <laughs> 25-year-old Kelly Fraser rose to fame across the Canadian Arctic by singing the Rihanna song Diamonds in Inuktitut. Fraser has dealt with tragedy in her young life and draws on that to spread a message of healing and resilience to Inuit youth. Her story is next Sunday on The National. Here are some of the stories we're following this week on The National. The City of Toronto will learn the results of its legal challenge against the Ontario government on Monday. It's fighting Premier Doug Ford's plan to cut the size of City Council from 47 to 25. City lawyers argue the change would violate the charter rights of voters and candidates. The Humboldt Broncos return to the ice on Wednesday for their season opener. Their first home game since the bus crash last April that killed 16 and left others with lifelong injuries. They'll face the Nipawin Hawks, the same team the Broncos were traveling to play the night of the crash. Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh are both meeting with their caucuses this week. The NDP retreat will begin in Surrey, British Columbia, while the Liberals are meeting in Saskatoon. 
Both parties will be discussing platform issues that will take them into the federal election a little over a year away. It's not often a wrong phone number brings lots of people together, but a missed connection at the University of Calgary has done just that. Here's the background. Carlos Zatina met a young woman named Nicole at a bar, asked for her number, but later he discovered that number didn't work. He was determined, though, and emailed every Nicole with a U of C email. Unfortunately, the Nicole didn't get the message, but all the others sure did, and the Nicoles have our moment of the day. And so after all the emails went out, we created a Facebook group called Nicole from last night. Call it a bonding experience. All the Nicoles, Nickies, even Nicolettes at U of C, 246 of them, strangers really, were invited to meet up at a local bar, and a bunch did. When the email started rolling through, I was just so excited. It made me instantly feel less lonely on campus. To be thrown together with 240-ish, kind of neat other University of Calgary students who share my name or derivatives of my name um, has been great. Turns out they have more in common than just their name, and they're going to try to meet up once a month. And the kicker? While the Nicoles were hanging out, the Nicole got in touch. Turns out she didn't mean to give Carlos the wrong number. And then we were like, oh, we got so excited. And because we'd had his number from the email that he sent to 250 women, <laughs> um, we connected them. So the Nicoles, while they played matchmaker, Carlos and the Nicole are going to meet up, at least as friends. So the Nicole apparently did not have an email that Carlos could find. Uh, but as you, as I just mentioned, uh, they are going to get together. The Nicole, start to talk to our colleagues at CBC Calgary, didn't want her voice used uh, publicly. But uh, she did tell uh, CBC Calgary that uh, she wants to meet as friends. I'm not sure what Carlos is hoping for, but uh, at least they'll get together. And we'll stay on top of this developing story for you. That is The National for September 9th. Good night.